Glad to have you. My name's Teddy Baker, along with my wife, Jan. We are here to uh, to join in with Jim and Sandra Penner and doing this ministry on every Sunday. And we're just glad that you keep showing up. What a beautiful day, isn't it? Man? It's just great, no humidity, and just beautiful day in the neighborhood. Boy, we needed this. We, uh, we're glad that you're with us, especially if you're joining us via the internet. We're always uh, honored that when technology works and you know all the, uh, all the things come into play, we, we actually get out and, and literally go around the world. And we're always uh, honored by that and excited that uh, we have that ability to be able to share with folks uh, literally all over the United States and, uh, and around the world. So uh, it's, it's a pretty cool thing. I'm always amazed. We're going to do a little uh, little praise and worship here this morning, and this is a great old hymn, and we're going to continue, uh, I started a, a, a series last week about freedom, and uh, we're going to be staying in that uh, this week and for the next couple of weeks, talking about freedom, and uh, so we're going to sing a little bit about that today. We praise the O God. For the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, to the Psalmist and Sardis and Bye. 
That generally comes uh, with uh, with Becca. I want to lift Becca up today. She had some uh, surgery, and it's uh, just word this morning is that she's doing really well and uh, just in really good spirits. And she's always got such a, a great positive attitude. And uh, but Mr. PV that is generally with her, uh, uh, they they found out I, I think that he has like a, a brain tumor, and uh, and he's home with his son, wow. and um, and is not going to be able to join us. Uh, up here anymore and so uh, we hope that uh, maybe his son has internet and he can join us uh, via the internet but we want to lift uh, them those two up in prayer and uh, just pray God's blessings over them they're, they're so such sweet sweet people and um, I want to continue to lift up Jan's dad Jim hires as uh, he, he took a little fall and, and has a couple of broke ribs and uh, along and, and Sherry Connor, she's she's joining him as well with some either broken or bruised ribs. So you people be careful walking around out there, man. I mean, it's dangerous out there, boy. But we want to certainly lift uh, these these prayer requests up, and uh, uh, we uh, have a Joey and Allie. We prayed for you guys last week, and we want to continue to to pray uh, for their son Tucker and. Just pray that God will just do an amazing work in, in, the, in his life. And uh, we, we just love it when God shows off and does amazing things in our lives. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. Yeah. Really is. Let's pray together. Father, 
We thank you for just another beautiful day in these North Georgia mountains. God, what a privilege it is to be able to live here and to be able to worship here and especially in this place where, Lord, we give you the freedom to allow just your spirit to come and, and just fill this place with your presence. God, we don't take it for granted that this is a freedom that we have and the opportunity to be able to gather together as your children and, and to look at what you're doing through your word and through just each other's lives, how you just manifest yourself uh, in each one of us. It's just amazing to watch, God. It truly is amazing grace that you offer us. We have truly been set free. We love you today, Father. We thank you for every single day that you give us. We pray your blessings over our message today, our, our worship. God, let everything we do and say, we do it for your glory. We pray, Father, that you'll hear it in that spirit. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Well, I, we, we had a, a friend, I wanted to include the Rogers family uh, in our prayer. Uh, we, we have just a, a really close friend to our family, uh, Rob Rogers, and uh, this past week his, his father passed away um, from just a, a long battle with cancer. And, uh, and he passed away on July 4th. And, uh, you know, I was thinking through about what I was going to teach. Uh, and I'd been, wa been wanting to do a, a, a series on freedom. Um, and last week we talked about the legacy of freedom. And when he passed away, and I went, well, how fitting. How fitting it is on the day of freedom to get real freedom. Mm -hmm. To experience total freedom. How cool is that? That God, as we are celebrating the freedom of our, our nation, that God would set this man free. I said, okay, God, I get the big picture. We're going to talk about freedom for the next few weeks. And today I want to talk about the life of freedom. In the book of Galatians, Paul is dealing with uh, an issue that has, has risen up among the, the believers in Galatia. And, uh, and, and it's, it's about laws, it's about rules and the regulations and sometimes of the things that, that we find ourselves that mistakenly they, they try to cover themselves as religion. What, but what it really ends up being is legalism. And we want to talk about that today. You know, I, as I was doing some research this past week, I, I was really surprised at how many states in our nation have these really crazy, surprising laws. I mean, it, it was amazing that, uh, you know, in Florida, a woman may be fined for falling asleep under a hairdryer. <laughs> now, I don't know how many of you ladies go to the salon anymore and sit up under the hairdryer, but, you know, if you do that in Florida and you fall asleep, they're going to find you. <laughs> it's also against the law in Florida for, uh, it's against the law for, to, to participate in dwarf tossing. <laughs> so, you know, if you have any little people as friends, you don't want to be tossing them around in the state of Florida because it's against the law. In Indiana... In Indiana, citizens are not allowed to attend a movie within four hours after eating garlic. <laughs> That's not a bad law. Yes. I, I like that. I deal with that. Okay. In Iowa, a man with a mustache is forbidden from kissing a woman in public. I don't know what that's about. You, know, you get all that stuff in your mustache, you know. <laughs> In a little place called Normal, Illinois, it's against the law to make a face at a dog. <laughs> in Wisconsin, it's against the law to serve apple pie in restaurants unless there's cheese on top of it. 
That sounds a little fishy to me. It sounds like good old boy politics, you know. Yeah, you gotta have cheese on the apple pie, you know. And it's probably not a good thing that I'm not a, a that I'm not a pastor in Nicholas County, West Virginia, because no member of the clergy is allowed to tell jokes or humorous stories from the pulpit. No. <laughs> I'd be in big trouble, boy. Then <laughs> they'd be writing me tickets every week, you know. <laughs> but this morning, I, I do. I, I, as I said earlier, I want to talk about one of the greatest hindrances, in my opinion, to spiritual growth, and that is the tolerance of legalism in the body of Christ. Living the life of freedom can be stunted, even choked to death by the weeds of legalism. Legalism can be defined as a, as a strict adherence to the law, specifically as it relates to faith. And a legalist is one who believes that performance is the way to gain favor with God. Legalism is the, the human attempt to gain salvation or to prove our spirituality by outward conformity to a list of religious do's and don'ts. Well, I do this. Well, I don't do that. And so, here, here are some observations that I want to make about legalism. We tend to think that others are legalistic, but that we're not. The fact is, is that we all are legalistic by nature. We tend to judge others by our own standards of what is acceptable and what isn't. In essence, we, we think our sins smell better than other people's. <laughs> and we have very little tolerance for people who sin differently than we do. You know, well, I might be, you know, I might do this. I'm not as bad as that guy over there. <laughs> You, know, you heard of the two brothers that were, they lived in this real small town and one brother was just a hellion. I mean, he just, you know, he womanizer, drank a lot, did a lot of drugs and everything. And, and one, di one day he died. And so we, his brother goes to the pastor and he says, look, I know my brother was just, you know, a tough guy, just rough, lived rough. He says, but I want, you know, I got a blank check right here. I'm going to slide right over here to you. You put any amount in you that you want to because I want you to say something nice about my brother. <laughs> and so the pastor says, well, man, that's really tough because this guy was, I mean, he, he, he was terrible. He was, he was just a terrible person. And what, what can he said, I'll tell you what, let me think about it. So he took the check and he filled in a little amount, you know, that he was going to use. And the next day they have the funeral service. And he says, you know, old Bob here, he was a, he was a real hellion. He drank, he was a womanizer, he did drugs, he stayed out all night, did all these terrible things. But compared to his brother, <laughs> this man's a saint. <laughs> And we tend to look at others that way. And we have very little tolerance for people that sin differently than we do. Another observation about legalism is that it's highly contagious. Legalism can spread like a bad virus through an entire congregation. Legalism can take a, a vibrant faith and make it dull and lifeless. It can evaporate enthusiasm. It can jettison joy. It can stifle spirituality. Instead of finding freedom through Christ, many believers are living with great burdens on their shoulders about their walk with the Lord. You see, legalism produces a sense of self-righteousness and judgment. It majors in guilt and misguided sacrifice. Legalism urges its followers to evaluate their relationship with God on the basis of standards and scores. 
So you got a score sheet over here, and you know, well, I got a star this morning. I did this, and I, I did that. So I got four stars this morning. I'm good. There are, there they are, right there, four of them, all lined up, gold, gold stars. <laughs> They're real good. But the thing is, is that type of mindset, we also expect others to do the same, which is, you know, a, a great definition of codependency. You know, if I can get you to do exactly what I want you to do, then I'll feel better about myself. Well, the thing is, I can't fix myself. I can't do that. So how am I going to fix you? That's why I don't, you know, I don't demand a lot from you folks other than show up and listen and let the Holy Spirit change your life from the inside out. He does the work. I don't have the brain for that. Super, superficial spirituality. And I want you to get this if I can say it properly. Superficial spirituality shortcuts the work of grace in your life. Legalism makes us very narrow and divisive. The legalists insist that everyone lives up to the standard that they have adopted. In other words, everyone needs to be like me. But see, I don't think that's such a bad thing. I think I'm a pretty good guy. I like you. You are. My wife likes me, see? I got one. <laughs> But when we think this way, we miss the delight of diversity in the body of Christ. That's why, you know, when, you, when it's snowing, it all looks like snow. But if you ever examine a snowflake, there's not two of them alike. Each one is different. Each one, the Bible says, has certain gifts that God has given us. You know, and we don't want to be a bunch of step for people that are walking around and all looking the same and acting the same. Diversity is a good thing. And legalism makes it impossible for people to see Jesus. That's the biggest thing. There is nothing that pushes a non-Christian away faster than a list of rules and regulations. They have to be able to see Jesus in us. And yes, we use words when we have to. In the Old Testament, the Sabbath, which is our Saturday, that was a big deal in the Old Testament. Did you know that in the time of Jesus, Jewish leaders had established 39 Sabbath clarifications with each having multiple subdivisions, making for over 1,500 prohibitions, things that you couldn't do. Now here's some of them. It was unlawful to kill a flea that lands on your arm because that would make you guilty of hunting on the Sabbath. Now these are real. If a man's ox fell into the ditch, he could pull it out. But if a man fell in, he had to stay in the ditch. You could dip your radish in salt. But if you left it there too long, you were pickling it. <laughs> and so thus you were working on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees actually had discussions on how long it took to pickle a radish. It was okay to spit on a rock on the Sabbath, but you couldn't spit on the ground because that made mud. Mud was mortar, and that was work. <laughs> and so if you would spit on the ground, they would actually come and measure how far your spittle would roll because it would make mud, and mud was mortar, and mortar was working. And now the Apostle Paul has come and he's carrying the gospel to the Gentiles. That's us. 
And he's in this place called Galatia. And now he's dealing with the effects of legalism in the lives of the believers there in Galatia because there was a group of people known as the Judaizers. And the Ju Judaizers wanted to add to the grace of God and add to what must be done to be saved, which for them was the right of circumcision. And so, here was the deal. I'm living in the day of Jesus. I'm 66 years old, and I just came to know Jesus. And the guy says, okay, great, get in that line over there because we're fixing to circumcise you. <laughs> no. <Nah. laughs> Not doing that. <laughs> and so you can see the conflict that these people were running into. Here, here's a group of new believers. They're trying to figure out, they're excited about Jesus because Paul and, and Barnabas and and all these apostles have been coming and telling and sharing the gospel with them. And now they here come these Judaizers who were starting to infiltrate their ranks and tell them that you've got to add this to really be saved. And you might say, well, you know, Teddy, we don't have that problem today. But the fact is, we very much have that problem in more diverse ways today than just conforming to the Jewish laws and to circumcision. The book of Galatians is primarily, a, the whole book of Galatians is, is a thesis on freedom. It's our freedom in Christ. It's our, our freedom in Christ is the most important aspect of this faith journey that we're on. That we will ever accept. If you ever grab hold and take ownership of the freedom that we have in Christ, it will absolutely change your life. And so this morning, I want to take the fifth chapter of Galatians, and I want to go through it in sections. It's, I've never taught this way before, because the Scriptures are so powerful, and what Paul is teaching is that I want, you, I, I want to go through and take it in sections, and then try to discuss it a little bit with you. So we're going to be in the fifth chapter of Galatians. If you have your Bibles, turn there. And we're going to try to get some, some, some vision on how to live the life of freedom. And once again, I'm going to be using the message translation to teach. Because again, it's just written in layman's terms. And it's written in a way that's easy to understand. So try to follow along in whatever translation you have. And then we'll, we'll go from there. Galatians 5.1 is probably one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. Can't tell you how many times I go back and read Galatians 5.1. Because it says Christ has set us free to live a free life. Okay, let's stop right there. Now, you're thinking, okay, we're going to get through this whole chapter. We haven't even made it through the first sentence yet. <laughs> but trust me, we're going to bunch them up and we'll, we'll get through it. So, again, there are sentences in the Bible that if you really get it, if you will allow the Holy Spirit to enable your heart to really get it, it will change everything in your life. And, and this is one of them. Christ has set us free to live a free life. The NIV translation says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Now, I believe it's a safe question to ask. What have we been freed from? My opinion, there are two primary things in the book of Galatians that teaches that we're set free from. The first thing is that we're set free from empty religion. Religion that is passionless religion. An empty, emotive religion. A, a type of nuanced 
I'm going to do these things. Religion. There's no joy in that. There is no life in it. There's no passion. And if you're living a life of freedom, there should be immense amount of joy in your religion if it's the religion of the Bible. And that's why I tell you all the time, you know, people, when I'm talking to people that are not believers, they always say, well, I hate religion. I go, I do too. <laughs> well, what do you mean? I thought you were like, go to church and pastor and teach. You know, I never tell people I'm a pastor. Never tell people. I never use the title Reverend so and so because it builds a wall. You know, and then, so when somebody, when I'm talking to them, they say, well, what do you do? I say, I'm in personnel reconstruction. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I work for a major corporation worldwide. We have offices all over the place. Great retirement program. And it's cool. It's good. Well, what do you do? Well, I help people reconstruct their lives. You know. Were you like a counselor or something? No, no, not really. religion is, is just joyless. See, I want to put a smile on your face. I want to put a song in your heart because that's what scripture does. This lifeless practice of religion that is not immersed in a personal relationship. If, if your religion is not immersed in the person and the work of Jesus Christ then I want to challenge you today check out your religion the second thing that I believe that we're free from is fear based behavioral modification and this is very important we're going to talk a little bit about this we're going to talk a lot about it next week we'll talk a little bit about it this morning there's a reason that so many of us are trying to do better. We're, we're, we're trying not to do these things. We're trying to do these things. And really the motivation behind all of it is fear. Well, if I don't do this, if I, if I don't go here, if I don't say this, if I don't do this, then God is going to get me somehow. And... When you think about it, I, I know what my dad did when I didn't do what he said. You know, when I didn't do what he said, I got a spanking. And so I can only imagine this infinite sovereign God. That if I got a spanking for that, I can't imagine what I'm going to get if I tick off the Heavenly Father here. If I make him mad. Is he going to be angry with me because of what I did or didn't do? You know? So, everything driving up this behavioral modification is fear. It's not faith. We have been set free from empty religion and fear-based behavior modification. Now, here's the part of the text that I love. So, We've been set free for what purpose? We've been set free for freedom. It's for freedom that you've been set free, which means not only have we been saved from something, we've been saved to something. And I found in my conversations with a lot of people that this is a part of their faith that, that really hasn't sunk in. That we would freely acknowledge that we've been saved from. So what are some of the things that we've been saved from? Well, number one, we've been saved from hell. That's good. <laughs> we've been saved from our sins. That's real good. We've been saved from a sense of condemnation. Romans 8.1 For there is no condemnation for anyone 
who's in Christ Jesus. Very powerful verse. And we get that. But few of us get that we've been saved to. Now what have we been saved to? We've been saved to the freedom of knowing God's true affection for us. And that it does not waver despite our persistent failures and our shortcomings. God loves you, as I say. God loves me, warts and all. And we've been set free to enjoy that. and to, We've been set free to walk in that. We've been set free to pursue at the highest level the pleasures that bring about life and vitality and real living as opposed to the enslaved type of pleasure that carries with it this aftertaste of guilt and shame. When the Bible says that in Jesus Christ you have been set free in order to walk in the freedom to, that is the freedom to live, to love in ways that you've never experienced in your own effort to live and love. It's, it's your love through Christ. It, it's not just this love of the flesh. It's not a, a license to go do anything that you want to do. So what does Paul say next? He says, knowing that, so take your stand. Take a stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. And he goes on to say in verse 2 and 3, he says, I'm emphatic, emphatic about this. The moment any one of you submits to circumcision or any other rule-keeping system, at that same moment, Christ's hard-won gift of freedom is squandered. He says, I repeat my warning. The person who accepts the ways of circumcision trades all the advantages of the free life in Christ for the obligations of the slave life of the law. Now, did you get that? Paul says... Take your stand and stand firm. Don't get back under the yoke of slavery. He says, don't do it. And this is a, a paradigm shift that I'm hoping that you get out of this chapter. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not just for people to be saved with. The gospel of Jesus Christ not only saves us, it sustains us. It gives us the ability to stand firm against the sharp arrows of the enemy who is coming at us all the time, the ways of the world. You've got to remember that Satan is the father of this world. So the pleasures, the things of this world, he is going to use, he knows what buttons to push. I've been known to tell a joke that's not, it's a little off color. I've been prone to, to laugh or to say things or to have thoughts that do not line up with my relationship with Christ because I'm human. And that stuff, if I don't recognize where it comes from and if I don't deal with that, that's going to hang around and trip me up because the more I do it, the easier it's going to be. And so I spend a lot of time to say, Lord, against you and you only have I sinned. And I agree with him. I'm not going to walk around and beat myself up because I slammed my door, hand in the, in the door and I didn't say, golly. <laughs> so it's, it's this type of mindset that the gospel of Jesus Christ sustains us. You see, we don't move on from the gospel once we're saved. 
We preach the gospel to ourselves sometimes minute by minute some days. <laughs> days you're the bug, some days you're the windshield, you know. <laughs> Hour by hour, week by week, month by month, year by year, from the moment he wakes up our hearts to the gospel until the very moment he calls us home, we make our stand in the gospel of Christ. And we need to stand firm in the gospel and no, not go back to the yoke of slavery. So how would that work itself out? We're free. Paul says the moment that we submit ourselves to anything else but the gospel of Jesus Christ, we trade all the advantages of the free life in Christ for the obligations of the slave life of the law. And the Bible says that when, when you come to know Christ, we are given a new heart. Now, that's not the muscle beating in your chest. We are giving a new inner person that the Holy Spirit has, has moved in, taken up residence in that inner being of who you are. And that we're given a new heart by God through Christ, through faith in Christ. And then the Spirit of God begins to change you from the inside out. The scripture in verses 4 through 6 says this. Paul says, I suspect that you would never intend this, but this is what happens. When you attempt to live by your own religious plans and projects, you were cut off from Christ. You fall out of grace. And meanwhile, we expectantly wait for a satisfying relationship with the Spirit. While we're on this faith journey, every day we are waiting expectantly for the Holy Spirit to show up in our lives. To be able to feel that change, to notice that change, to be determined about the change in our life. He says, for in Christ, and I want you to get this, this is so powerful. He says, for in Christ, neither our most conscientious religion nor disregard of a religion amounts to anything. What matters is something far more interior. Faith expressed in love. He says, I don't care how much religion, ceremonial stuff you do. I don't care how many prayers you say. I don't care how many times you read the Bible. I don't care if you read it from Genesis to maps. If it's not making a difference, if you're not expressing your faith through love, you've missed the point. And likewise, if you're out there, all the things that you don't do. Well, I read my Bible every day, but Jan doesn't. <laughs> it's not about that. God says, I'm not, in, I'm not impressed by that. What I'm, I'm impressed is your faith in my son, Jesus Christ, and the work he wants to do in your life and what really impresses me is your faith expressed in love. <clears throat> wow. You got to take ownership of these, the last part of these verses. I mean, listen again. For in Christ, neither our most conscientious religion nor disregard of religion amounts to anything. What matters is something far more interior, faith expressed in love. You see, being righteous in fellowship with Jesus isn't about the rules that you keep and the head knowledge. See, a legalist has a ton of head knowledge. 
I don't care what's in your head. I want to know what's in your heart. I want to know what's changing down there. I tell you guys all the time, I'm educated beyond my level of obedience already. It's not information I need, it's transformation that's going to make a difference in my life and in your life. It's about faith expressing itself in love. One way we might examine our faith is by asking the, the spiritual question, how's your love life doing? The Bible says again, he says the only thing that, that counts is faith expressing itself in love. Why is that important? Because that's agape. That's agape love. That's unconditional love. That's the way God loves us. And if it's not of faith, then it doesn't count for righteousness sake. Does that make sense? If it's not faith expressed in love, it, it doesn't count for righteousness in your life. And if it's not in love, then it isn't a faith. It's fear. Faith deals with people through love. And sometimes we must act on love even when we don't feel that loving. <laughs> And we can only do this by a genuine faith. Because the flesh, this earth suit we walk around in, the old sin nature, the head up here that thinks, gets all quirky and weird sometimes, the flesh will say, no way. But faith says, I must. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote, do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. If you injure someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking him more. It's like, you know, don't kick a dog when he's down. You know, if you're, you're on the bottom of the pile, it's not a good place to be. But, C.S. Lewis says, if you do him a good turn, you will find yourself disliking him less. He says, faith acts before it feels. I love that. Faith acts before it feels. That's because true believers, he says, live waiting for righteousness with an attitude of loving kindness. He says, if you really want people to see your faith, show them your love. If you want the church to recognize your spiritual growth and maturity, don't quote us your creed. Show us your love. And when a Christian believes this, he says the results are amazing. Now Paul goes on the right in verses 7 through 10. Let's look at these because I'm running out of time. <laughs> Paul says, you were running superbly. Who cut, you, cut in on you, deflecting you from the true course of obedience? This detour doesn't come from the one who called you into the race in the first place. And please don't toss this off as insignificant. It only takes a minute amount of yeast to permeate an entire loaf of bread. Deep down, the Master has given me confidence that you will not defect. But the one who is upsetting you, whoever he is, will bear the divine judgment. And so what I want to tell you this morning is that it only takes a little bit to get you off course. It's like a, a plumb line. You know, for those of you that are into building things, I'm into destruction. I'm not real good at construction. I can tear stuff up, my heartbeat. But, you know, if you hang a plumb line from up here, and if it's a little bit off up there, it's going to be way off down here. And he says it only takes a little bit of this attitude to infect 
to become infectious. So what I want to say is be cautious about being influenced by other teachings and teachers because not everything out there is of God. Don't take what I say. I'm giving you my opinion. I'm giving you what I've studied and come to understand about the Bible. Doesn't mean I'm an expert. Test the scriptures. Test to see what I'm saying is true. Don't just go, well, well it's on the internet. It must be true. <laughs> or that's what he said. So I, so I believe it. <laughs> Don't do that. Test the teaching. Measure it against the scriptures. Paul had others. He had a bunch of these Judaizers who were spreading fake news. That's become the big phrase today. And so they were spreading fake news about Paul. And this is what Paul says. I love this. He says, as for the rumor that I continue to preach the ways of circumcision as I did in those pre-Damascus days. You know, Paul was, you know, he, he, he was a, a defender of the Jewish religion. And he was, uh, he inspired and conspired to take down the, the Christian belief. He says, that is absurd. He said, why would I still be persecuted then if I were preaching that old message no one would be offended if I mentioned the cross now and then. It would be so watered down, it wouldn't matter one way or the other. Why don't these agitators, this is what I love, this is a Trump statement, you know, I don't know. He says, why don't these agitators, obsessive as they are about circumcision, why don't they just go all the way and castrate themselves? <laughs> Now, I've said some pretty rough stuff in the pulpit, but I've never invited anybody to emasculate themselves. <laughs> and he says, why don't these guys, why don't they just go all the way? They want to talk about circumcision so much. Why don't they just go ahead and cut it all off? That's some pretty radical humor that Paul's trying to get across. He goes on to say, it's absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's Word is summed up in a single sentence. Love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out. In no time at all, you will be annihilating each other. And where will your precious freedom be then? See, living the life of freedom is not being able to do whatever you want. It's not a license to say, well, I can just go live the way I want to and God's going to forgive me. No. No. He says you can't. It's putting yourself back under a yoke of slavery. It's setting not only healthy boundaries for the way that you live, it's setting holy boundaries for your life. You accomplish that the best way when you are willing to love others as you love yourself, you can do great things. So how are you doing in that area of loving yourself? Do you beat yourself up? Do you look in the mirror and see negative things? Do you deal with shame and guilt and fear and other stuff that the world stack on you? Mostly religious people. They'll do that in a heartbeat. Well, what you ought to do is you shouldn't do that anymore. It's like going to the doctor. Doc, it hurts when I do this. Don't do that. <laughs> See, the faith journey is so much more. Paul goes on to say this. My counsel, counsel is this. Live freely. 
animated and motivated by God's Spirit, then you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness. For there is a root of sinful self-interest in us that is at odds with a free spirit. Just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness, there are two ways of life. It says these two ways of life are antithetical so that you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. Why don't you choose to be led by the Spirit and so escape this erratic compulsion of a law-dominated existence? He says that there is a root of sinful self-interest in each one of us that is at odds with the Spirit of God trying to change us from the inside out. And he says these, these two ways of life are antithetical. They will not, they cannot exist in the same place. They are always going to be against each other. So Paul says, let's do this the easy way. Let's choose to be led by the Spirit. And he goes on to say, it is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or to be loved, divided homes, divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. What kind of world we live in today? Uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions. Ugly parodies of the, com uh, of the community. And he said, and I could go on. This isn't the first time I have warned you if you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit the king, God's kingdom. In other words, you will not inherit the blessings of the free life that God has given us to live. Everything I just read, poster boy. Put my picture right beside all of that. Because that's how I lived. Out of control. That was me. Now, Take that same picture and let's slide it down to the next little paragraph. Because I want to read, listen to what God does. But what happens when we live God's way? It brings gifts into our lives. Much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. I like that picture. He goes on to say, and I want you to hear this. He says, legalism is helpless in bringing this about. It only gets in the way. And among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindless responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good, is crucified when you come into that relationship with Christ. And he closes out by saying this, since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implications in every detail of our lives. That means that we will not compare ourselves with each other as if one of us were better and another one was worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives. 
each of us is an original. I love that. A guy named A.W. Tozer is an author and he writes some great devotions. He says this, The widest thing in the universe is not space. It is the potential capacity of the human heart. Being made in the image of God, it is capable of almost unlimited extension in all directions. And one of the world's greatest tragedies is that we allow our hearts to shrink until there is room in them for little beside ourselves. You can't mix grace and law. If you decide to live in the bondage of the law, then you cannot live in the freedom of grace. What we believe shows up in the way we behave. It's important to watch the way we live because what we really believe is demonstrated by the way we live. Are we living a life of true freedom in Christ Jesus? Are we free of living with the burden of sin and legalism? You see, we must each choose to come to Christ. We each must lay at the cross all of our burdens and those things that enslave us. We cannot clean up our act also before coming because we will never be able to clean ourselves to God's standards. We come, as the old hymn says, just as I am. And we let Jesus clean us. You see, Jesus does love you just the way you are. He just loves you enough not to leave you the way you are. He wants to change you. We let Jesus set us free. Would you be set free today? I hope so. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the power of your word. Never get over being made, amazed at how your word just permeates our souls to the very marrow. Your word really is a two-edged sword. It, it cuts us deep in it, but it lifts us up. It inspires us. And God, I'm so thankful that you inspired Paul to write this book and, and especially this chapter that focuses so much on the life of freedom that you've given us to live. Father, help us to be aware of the, the feelings of guilt and shame and, and all the things that the world just wants to pile on us. God, help us to stay clear of religious fanatics that are just odd for God, that just want to, you know, just lay on us a burden of rules and regulations and things that you have to do so that we can know you. You've done everything possible so that we can know you. You sent the very best you had to come and to make a way for us to be in relationship with you. I just pray your continued blessings in doing that, Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 God bless y'all. Thank you for coming.